So, welcome back, Elden Ring, the Ultimate Guide, Part 3, and straight away we're warping to the Seaside Ruins. Now, from this grace, you're going to follow the cliffside to, to the north to pick up the reward for the painting we picked up in the first episode. So, to reiterate once again, you collect these paintings, then you go to the spot where they were painted, and a ghost will appear, as you can see there. Ignore this bat. And in this case, it drops the Incantation Scarab. Now, from here... Um, we're going to walk to Agia Lake South, then head up the North Road towards a carriage, which there's a few of in the game, this is the first. And it will be protected by a large group of enemies, and we're going to attack it from the rear because it's a hell of a lot easier than attacking it from the front side where they can all immediately see you. So the first enemies we're going to encounter are these little wandering noble guys, and what is it they drop, Tony? So the Wandering Nobles can actually drop a bunch of different stuff. There's four or five different types of Wandering Nobles. So there's the Common Noble. Um, these drop, and it's it's kind of hard to differentiate them, I will admit. Um, but the Common Nobles can drop the Aristocrat, Aristocrat Garb, the Noble's Slender Sword. Um, so the ones that have a slender looking sword can indeed drop it. Uh, the Noble Soldier. Uh, which can drop the aristocrat hat. So that's the one that wears the hat, the other soldiers. Uh, they drop the noble's S-stock. So if it's got a sort of piercing, thrusty weapon, it can drop that. The old noble, which can drop the old aristocrat set, which is uh, the cowl, the gown, and the shoes. Then there's the noble sorcerer, which is easy enough to spot because it is a sorcerer, uh, of which it can drop the glintstone staff, aristocrat garb, boots, and headband. And then there's the Treasurer Nobles, and they can drop a big-ish rune. Um, but those ones are fixed in-game, so uh, you don't need to watch out for them too much. Uh, basically, the Nobles, the, the, the most important thing is if the little Noble guys can drop their set and their weapons, generally speaking. Now, here's a technique we've, we found. These Kaiden Cell Swords on the horses are a pain in the fucking arse. But you can, in fact, use Storm Stomp to kind of stun them continuously and knock them off the horses so that's pretty helpful so we can bear that in mind um, as we mentioned in the last part or indeed the first part actually just be spam and triangle all the time and just pick up as many items as you can and once you've dealt with all these enemies you can now stop the car and to do that you can hit one of the trolls they'll get a bit angry at you but ultimately will stop the car and this will allow you to get into the car and get the great axe I think yeah yeah, you're right. You're right. It's the Great Axe. Um, that yeah. trick, by the way, you can use it on basically every carriage, um, but there is one, weirdly, that you don't need to use it on. Yeah, and we do show you that one, and that one is uh, pretty important. Now, just off to the this, near this cliff edge, uh, uh, to the to the west of the road, I guess, is a, um, a smith and stone, so remember to pick it up. And then kind of directly opposite, we're going to head up this... Uh, it's kind of rocky hill edge, hillside type thing to the top where there's like a little crucifix type thing. And up here, I think there is a, ooh, a gold rune? Pickled no, fowl it's fowl a pickled fowl, fowl foot. Now, so the... we're coming up to the, uh, one of these waypoint ruins. Yeah, there's a few enemies here. And these are Miranda sprouts. They can drop Miranda powder and poison blooms. Um, picking up a couple of items here. There's also one above on that little wall there. Um, these things are a pain in the ass to deal with unless you have fire damage, which we will demo as and when that becomes relevant. But once you've grabbed those items, I'm just going to head down here and take on a boss. And this would be, I think, the Solo Pumpkin Head? Uh, yeah, it is a Solo Pumpkin Head. Now, uh, this is uh, another great enemy where... Um... Ground slam and imps and bleed is uh, just a great, just a great way of dealing with it. Now its head can absorb an amount of damage, so just kind of try and hit it from the back. But that's very easy uh, when you have a bunch of imps um, effectively doing most of the work for you. As you can see, they're putting in some amount of work against this boss, and ground slam can uh, stagger them if you get enough of them in, and then you can go for the critical. Easy peasy. I don't think any is going to have any kind of issues with that. Now this is Selen. So Sorceress Selen is your early game 
sorcery merchant, as the name might suggest. Um, you take up an apprenticeship with her, you get the nod and thought gesture for agreeing to do that. Um, she is tied to a couple of other characters' quests. We'll talk about that as and when it pops up. But uh, for now, she'll just stay here. She has a quest that's tied to um, defeating one of the shard bearers um, a little bit later on in the game. And you never actually lose her as a merchant, which is nice. Um, even when you finish her quest, she's still able to be used as a merchant. And we need to do her quest a certain way to get a certain reward. There's a spell that she sells eventually that she otherwise you, well you otherwise wouldn't have access to if you did her quest the alternate way we're going to show you do we show both both ends uh, to her quest no no we only have the one but the other one is uh is irrelevant because you get the reward for the other one even if you do a quest so it's you can either do the quest one way and get one reward or do the quest the other way and get both of them so So here we are at, a ma at another mass grave, but just before this, uh, there is a uh, one singular noble sorcerer under that ruin, and that sorcerer will always drop the um, the glintstone staff. Uh, yes, the glintstone staff. So that is a guaranteed way of getting a staff this early in the game if you didn't pick a uh, like a magic class to start with. Very generous requirements on the. Uh... <clears throat> On the sorcerer staff as well it's a um 10 int catalysts or any of the early game spells you can pretty much cast straight away as long as you have 10 intelligence it's pretty cool so we're following this cliff edge along we kind of overshot it a little bit which is actually kind of good that we showed that because it shows that it is quite easy to overshoot but effectively we're looking for uh, this little sort of graveyard area here to get the sacrificial twig um and now we are heading to the uh, Mistwood Ruins. And you can see up there, uh, that's uh, a character called Blyde. Um, so deal with this fucking bear. Because, you know, just... Like, wh like, what does he think he's doing? Like, we're, so we're holding a sword. This thing's like, yeah, I'm going to kill you. But okay, so Blyde is sitting up there at the top of the ruins. We need to use a gesture to get him down. We'll get that later. But for now, um, be in crouch mode come in here and get the smith and stone too now there is a a fucking uh, rune bear and uh, we want to avoid that because um we try to fight as few of these things as possible frankly but down here you're going to pick up the axe talisman um one of the better talismans especially in the early game it gives you i think a 15 percent boost to your charged attack damage now we've popped over to carly because if you ask him about the Howling in the Mistwood, he will give you the finger snap gesture that lets you go back to the Mistwood ruins where we just were, use the gesture, and that will allow you to continue Blythe's quest. Correct. So we can warp to this particular grace, um, take this angle through the woods, pick up that one golden rune one, because it's, it's, it's very important you pick that up. Uh, but now we're back at the ruins. And we can use the whistle gesture that we just... No, sorry, the finger snap gesture that we just got to um, call this motherfucker down. I, I mean, you could just ask him. Don't know why you need to do the gesture. You could easily just shout yeah. up and be like, yo. Yeah, he, he will only respond to the word yo. You have to very specifically <laughs> say that word. Aye. So, uh, speak to him, exhaust his dialogue... Uh, just to be fair, also you should have done that with Selen. Just make sure you um, empty out all her prompts and stuff like that until she's just repeating her dialogue. Um, and now we are heading southeast to... Um, this is the Merchant, I think we go to. I'm pretty sure. And then now we're going to get the, the cookbooks that we missed the first time we came to this Merchant. Yeah, so just sort of going back. Up. Just sort of going back, filling in the blanks here. Like picking up these... Uh these cookbooks it's not super necessary we don't get anything essential from grabbing these not really um it's just nice to have for completeness's sake yeah so long as you follow exactly what we're doing you will end up with all the cookbooks so now we are warping to um fort hate grace yeah that's right and now we are gonna go to fort hate and this is where we get um, a really great Ash of War. Honestly, Limgrave has uh, 
a fantastic selection of early game stuff. So from doing this part of the game, this little uh, fort quest area, we'll get his Bloody Slash, which is absolutely fantastic in a bunch of different applications. But before that, we're going to grab this golden seed and we're going to just juke this big pumpkin head and head into the fort. Now, you will get kind of swarmed with like an amount of enemies. You're getting fire bombs are thrown at you. There's a bunch of rats. So just try and um, do your best to avoid these enemies. Which I'm what not you doing could a always... particularly great job at. <laughs> what you could always do is uh, once you get past the pumpkin head and you're in the doorway, you could save quit because that you would could... um, de-aggro all the enemies from the bottom of the stairs. Exactly turns like out... we just did. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> turns out that's exactly what i just done. <laughs> it still wasn't helping. I'm still getting pelted by firebombs. I mean, I guess you are still getting pelted with firebombs, but you're not getting attacked by a pumpkin head and a bunch of Godric soldiers, so there is that. This is true. Now, those Godric soldiers that were outside, they can also uh, drop the uh, Lord Sworn's great, uh, straight sword, the Brass Shield, which is a fantastic shield. Uh, pick up that cookbook, by the way. Can't forget that. But the Brass Shield is a fantastic shield. Uh, the Godric soldier set, which is the, the helm, the surcoat, the gauntlets, and the greaves. They can also drop smith and stones, bolts, Lord Sworn's bolts, uh, war pick if they're holding it, and the heavy crossbow if they are wielding it. Um, so pretty good drops from them. Uh, the best one being the brass shield, which is probably the best medium shield in the game if you can get a hold of it. Absolutely now, right now. Oh, I was sorry, going to say, um, here's a Godric Knight, um, a slightly tougher enemy, and this one's actually unique because it uses those blood attacks, as you just saw. And what you just did there was Bloody Slash. Now, that's the reward you get for defeating this, um, this particular knight. Um, I believe he can drop his full armor set, his shield, his sword, um, and in this one specifically, as I've said, drops Bloody Slash. And it's this chap you had to kill for completing Kenneth Heights. Uh, Kenneth Heights quest, where he will reward you with the Erd Steel Dagger. We will be going to pick that up um, in just a little bit. But for now, you're going to take this ladder, and at the top of here is a chest. In that chest is one of the most important items in the game. It's one half of the Dectus Medallion, and that allows you to access a much later game area um, significantly earlier. Now, you saw us jump on top of the chest there. Um, if you position yourself just right, you can jump on top of a chest and open it and skip the animation for um, opening it. It's not necessary, but it is a fun thing you can do. Yeah, I just thought it'd be a cool thing to show you guys. Um, now, on top on uh, on the topic of those Godric knights, so those foot soldiers, soldiers, and knights, um, the knights, which is the guy we just uh, defeated, you are right, you can, you can drop his entire armor set as well as the great sword. Um, they can also wield a partisan and the uh, Gilded Great Shield. Now, here we are at Kenneth Height, and we got the Erd Steel Dagger, like you said. Now, just exhaust his dialogue, and that's pretty much him until quite near the end of the game, actually. Yeah, when you exhaust his dialogue here, he will move back to Fort Height, and I think we're going to show that now. And when he does, there'll be a bunch of demi-humans inside. He's tied to them in the law for some reason. So now there's a bunch of little... <laughs> little apes of his fault and you go up here you talk to him and he talks about not being able to make you a knight because I don't know there's no proper lord in Limgrave but it sounds like something we're going to fix later on inadvertently without really doing anything <laughs> yeah that is true uh, now the demi-humans um, whilst we're here they can drop the falchion, the club, the spiked club, the great the Great Knife, the Bloodstained Dagger, Rickety Shield, String, Glass Shards, Rune Fragments, Rainbow Stones, Glow Stones, and Volcanic Stones. Uh, Aye, so now, if it's useless, they can drop it. Yeah, pretty much. Um, now, hopefully you were able to realise that we went to that mass grave there, picked up a bunch of runes from that. And now we're still heading towards the Bridge of Sacrifice, which is near the south of Limegrave. And we are going to go over the bridge uh, just quickly and grab the grace on the other side. Hopefully you don't get fucking swarmed by a bunch of enemies because you, you uh, are bad at the game. So pick up the stone sword key. Again, as we've said before, you get a bunch of these, so you didn't need to 
Just just more proof that you didn't need to pick it as a starting item. And I'm having a, an incredibly difficult time fighting one guy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the problem was he had his back against a wall, so you couldn't just fish for a backstab. <laughs> yeah, he knew, he knew what he was doing. He was a, yeah, he's a, a veteran. Yeah, he's like, oh, I've been through this shit before. I know what the plan is. <laughs> <laughs> so we're picking up this grace just so we can warp here later on. So it's just a bit of a time saver, ultimately. Now, uh, again, if you've been following what we are doing, you will be able to add another charge to your Crimson Flask. Let's go. That's what we like to see. And now we are warping back to Agio Lake South. And from here, we are now... Um, going up towards the the first of the Everjails. The Everjails basically function like um, closed off boss arenas. Now, they are somewhat unique. Um, oh, we're not tackling the Everjail now. Oh, apparently we're, we're doing the this gap little first. bit to the side first. Okay, that's fine. So, okay, just um, follow along with what we're doing. Um, use the Spirit Spring to kind of launch up to this part of the I guess other side of the mountainous bit and we can grab another starlight shard from the basin thing what, what, what are they called again stone astrolabe that thing right so here we are some more godric soldiers uh, these aren't the foot soldiers and these aren't the knights just those ones are the soldiers um, i guess you can kind of tell because they're in sort of medium armor now we highly recommend that you take care of these um mages first and foremost because as you fight your way down, they will just be peppering you with spells. And it is a fucking pain in the ass, no matter how good you are at the game. And you also get the Royal House Scroll, which is an item that you can give to an NPC later on in the game. And that will expand that NPC's inventory to um, give you more cast, like more, um, just more spells to buy, I suppose. Don't know how else you'd describe it. I mean, you can... <clears throat> so for the prayer books which are the faith version and for the scrolls which are the intelligence version of the like additional spells from vendors items um there are often a couple of people you can give those to but it's best to save them all for one particular npc because that npc can teach you both spells and incantations and never disappears like some of the other merchants will yeah. So he's around permanently, just give them to him. Um, uh, to make it clear that uh, in case you don't use the um, the rest of the guide past this point, eventually you will discover a big turtle with a hat. So give it to him. He's the best person to give these scrolls to. So just fighting our way down. As you can see, this guy has the brass shield and the war pick, so he could drop both of those things theoretically. Although in our case, he's probably going to drop neither. Um, so here's uh, some more Kaiden Cell Swords, just to go over again what they can drop. They can drop the Kaiden Set, which is the Helm, the Armor, Gauntlets and Trousers. The Dismounter, Raw Raisins, Sweet Raisin and Frozen Raisins. Now we are going to use our bow to um, bait this guy up towards us and then we're going to use the Storm Stomp technique to uh, knock this fucker off his horse. And... Um, Sadly, his fucking animation glitched and he got up immediately before we could stab him when he's on the ground, but hey-ho, uh, we can put him back on the ground with our fucking fat bossy attack, so it's all good. I, mean, I was just about to say, like, yeah, he got up quickly, but you know what? We'll put him back on the floor quickly. <laughs> ground slam. <laughs> the solution, like, the, the question is, what is the problem? And the answer is always ground slam. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we're just heading down the side of that cliff and this is we're back at Agile Lake South now what we're going to be doing now is uh, putting poison on our weapon uh, and you, you'll see why right okay so a uh, bit of a cut there because we died to the thing that we're trying to do but we have to fight a rune bear just now and we're just showing you a technique that you can use to kill it currently uh we do basically recommend to come back here later on but if you kill this one particular just random fucking guy he will turn into a giant bear right so what you can then do from here 
is you can indeed use Poisonous Mist to poison the bear and uh, just run away and then wait for its health to drain slowly over time. That is a technique that you can use. However, it is excruciating in terms of how long it takes. And the item that this bear drops doesn't become relevant for quite a while. So it's not even technically, or even at all, not even technically, it's just not worth fighting just now. But if you're so inclined, you can just um, pepper it with arrows for about five minutes until eventually it fucking dies. So that is uh, a technique. As you can see, it clearly it just gives up on life after a certain period of time because its AI bugs out. But that is one way of dealing with that bear and getting a larval tier which is an item that you can give to an npc later in the game to change all of your stats so that's pretty good yeah it's probably worth honestly you could just leave that bear for way later you don't need to kill it at all the game gives you i think 18 larval tiers per playthrough so you've got plenty of other ways to obtain a larval tier in order to swap up your stats change your build um, but if you do need one at any point and you don't have any for some reason, uh, just save that bear until way later in the game and then come back and one-shot it. There's no real yeah. reason to fight it now. Um, so here we are at the Everjail. Um, now, if you activate it, you get teleported to this kind of like darker area that's kind of got a, a sort of semi-translucent fence that you can't get past. And for some reason, Blyde's summon sign is here. So for his quest, you can summon him for this particular boss. Um, now, this boss, again, is weak to Aslam, like almost everything. So uh, you plus Blyde will make fairly light work of it. Now, this boss indeed drops the uh, Bloodhound Fang. Now, I know you love this weapon, so I'll let you gush about it for a while. <laughs> so the Bloodhound's Fang is what I would consider to be the most um, beginner-friendly weapon in the game. It is long, it hits really hard, it scales well with strength and dexterity, it inflicts bleed, it can be buffed, it's upgraded with somber stones, so it's relatively cheap to upgrade. Um, generally speaking, that weapon can carry you from Limgrave until the last boss. It is exceptionally good. Now, just cutting myself off here, when you speak to Blythe, he'll give you a smithing stone, you can keep talking to him, exhaust his dialogue, and that's his quest finished for now, but... Back to explaining exactly what the Everjails are. They're like a mini closed off boss arena, and with this one as an exception, you normally can't summon inside them. So you can't summon your spirit ashes. Now, this would be a problem if we didn't have a technique to cheese every single Everjail boss. This is true. Um, but yeah, we do have. Um, there are certain Everjail bosses that are can be somewhat challenging because they tend to uh they can't be bled for the most part as far as i'm aware so obviously that's one of the, our main damage output like outputs is using bleed but don't worry we've got all the rest of these techniques covered so we're putting bloody slash on our katana we are at agio lake south again by the way so we'll put bloody slash on the katana and now we are off to actually fight the dragon of the lake um so, at this stage, the dragon is fairly easy. Um, you could come back later on, once you've completely finished Limgrave, and um, try the dragon then. But now isn't a bad time for it. You can uh, use your poison mist on your dagger, or whatever it's on. But you should probably put it on the dagger, that way you've got it as your, um, you know, your, your, your bidoof poison mist, I guess. You can just kind of throw it out whenever you need to. But, uh, yeah, so you can poison the dragon, which we've managed to do. Um, which is pretty easy with poison mist, actually. But really, the main way of getting good damage into the dragon is just using Bloody Slash on its head. The dragons tend to take a little bit extra damage when you hit them in the face. And look at that chunk of damage. Fantastic. Now, despite how big they are, it's still possible to miss your attacks bafflingly it doesn't even fucking make sense to me to be honest but um ultimately if you just time your bloody slashes you will be doing big fucking chunks to his face and that is what we like to see now his fire attacks are um they do do a lot of damage but luckily we do have that fire um the fire drake charm 
So remember to have that on for when you're fighting this thing to kind of help your fire defenses a little bit. And obviously remember that you've got Torrent, which can let you, you know, close distance with it because it will be flying away. Uh, flying all over the place is a bit of a pain that way. But ultimately, compared to other dragon fights in the game, he ain't so bad. Particularly because we don't have our, uh, our, in our incredible auto-kill dragon technique, which we will be getting later in the game. Um, but for now, we just have to kind of slog it with Bloody Slash, because there's kind of no other better alternative at this particular point in the game. But once I mean, dead... like what... Go on, I was going to say, like, likewise with the Rune Bear, you could just leave this until later, until you have the technique to kill it incredibly easily, if you this wanted. This is also true. Now, we're heading back to uh, Selen's uh, lair, I suppose. And now we are putting on Sacred Blade on our uh, sword. Now, this is a bit of a stopgap technique. Also, we're making it nighttime because uh, if you remember in part one, uh, we made it morning to avoid an enemy. At this point, we're now strong enough to fight that enemy. And this is also another enemy that you could, if you are struggling with, wait until later in the game where we get the ability to fight these enemies um, and make them very, very trivial with a technique that we um, uh, patented. Thank you very much. But um, for now, the best solution that we could find is using Sacred Blade just because ugh, it's just these enemies, man. They're honestly one of the worst enemies in the game for trying to fight because they are, again, this annoying combination of big but also difficult to hit which is very frustrating if you ask me. Um, now, your best bet is to always keep your guard up and um, try and wait for him to attack and after he's finished attacking, like, get your hit in. Um, really just being patient with these guys is your best bet. Uh, getting getting frustrated and, um, and getting greedy is going to be your downfall when you're fighting these guys. But there's a couple of different variants of this enemy. There's the one that you're seeing now that has a uh, like halberd. Um, and there's another one that has a flail. Now, I personally find the ones with the flails to be more irritating to fight. They have slightly shorter range, but they seem to hit harder relative to where they are in the game, which makes them kind of a pain in the ass to kill. Now, once you kill the horse, he will go prone. You can get a big crit in for some extra damage. And while he's on foot, this guy's a joke. Um, yeah. He can barely yeah. move, he has really slow attacks, you can just get in there, wail on him, and he will die. Um, he can re-summon the horse, so once you get him on the floor, it's a good idea to just finish him off as quick as you can. So he drops Repeat and Thrust, which is not something we ever used at any point in the guide. So uh, you can play about with it if you want, but clearly it's not that relevant. But otherwise, we are warping to uh, Rodrika's Shack at Stormhill, and now we're going up this sort of cliff area, uh, dropping off and heading to the end, where there is, in fact, uh, another crack tier to pick up. So that's pretty useful. And effectively now, we are just going to be tackling the northern portion of Limegrave. Um, once you get that crack tier, you can kind of drop off the edge. Um, and I think we are currently looking at Warmaster Shack. So... You can kind of get a feel for where we are by kind of grounding ourselves to the shack. So I think the next thing we're going to do is... Oh, it's either the Death Bird or it is the NPC Invader guy. I can't remember what one it is. We also pick up Quick Step here. Um... We use that a couple of times. Uh, you can pick it up when it's it's relevant. Stormblade is also actually a pretty good Ash of War. Um, it gives you a cool ranged attack uh, with you're just using a sword, so it's it's quite it's quite worthwhile. Uh, Stormblade, it's, it's it's not too bad. Um, I think at some point in the game we might use it, but it's uh, it's not it's not a big deal. Now heading out behind the shack, there is. Um, a whole bunch of trolls and this statue here um now you have to there's in the game there's a bunch of these statues that a big enemy has to hit and it'll crack the statue and then you can uh 
you can take the uh, the the juicy center, I guess. Uh, but otherwise, don't bother fighting the trolls. They're just going to gang up on you and stop the shit out of you. So what's the point? Looks like we're heading off to the NPC Invader now. Yeah, so, so the head, NPC like, Invader north-ish from the from the shack. Yeah, you're heading towards the Coliseum. If you open the map, you'll be able to see where the Coliseum is. Um, outside the Coliseum is a multiplayer um, item, and inside the Coliseum is where you get access to one of the three PvP arenas. So if you're interested in PvP, this is an important place to go. But before you go in there, you'll be invaded by Henricus. Um, he has the Great Mace, he has the Eruption Ash of War. It hits really hard if you get caught in it, so try and avoid getting hit by that. Um, generally though, um, for now it's just get hits in where you can. We don't yet have the means of completely trivializing every NPC fight, so it's sort of a struggle at this stage. Um, now, the big problem out. here was that I forgot to put Aslam back on, so I'm kind of having to slog it with uh, Sacred Blade. But um, otherwise it's still doable because Sacred Blade effectively gives you more range than he has. Um, and it does like decent enough damage. But if you had Aslam, that would be a lot easier. And he drops the Hammer Talisman. Yeah. So we're entering the... Coliseum now. You would interact with a little altar on the inside to uh, make PvP in this arena available, and you would access this from the statue of Marika that looks exactly like the one on this altar that you find inside the round table hold. It's next to the fireplace. Yeah, um, the fireplace that Rodrigo was standing next to, so you really you can't miss it. But when when they patch the end of the game, it, it, it's, it is fairly understated, I will say. So, heading back under the bridge that we, I guess, headed under to get to the Coliseum, there's this sort of um, ruin to the southeast. Uh, now, there's a scarab up there. Um, we thought shooting it might be a better idea, but actually it wasn't, and then we ended up missing it. So, this was a good way of just kind of showing you that um, if you do miss a scarab, you can just quit out, load back in, and then the scarab will be where it is. Just like the... Um, the the crystal lizards and dark souls one and three actually i suppose yeah the only one where that didn't work was dark souls 2 you had to actually rest at a bonfire to get them to come back yeah it was bullshit so that one drops a somber smith and stone one now I, here's another great item that lime grave gives us and we can indeed use the storm stomp ability on uh, this guy now just uh, just in case anybody was wondering it should have been fairly obvious because we didn't use it but the Storm Stomp stun thing doesn't work against the Black Rider Knight's Cavalry enemies, sadly. Um, I was very excited. When I first realized that Storm Stomp could stun these things in the Kaiden Cell Swords, I was like, yes, this, these fucking Black Riders ain't worth shit. But actually, they are worth a little bit of shit because uh, Storm Stomp uh, does fuck all against them. But when you kill this guy, he will... Um, Oh, fuck, what is it? it gives you? It's a... Uh... Golden Vow. Golden Vow, which is an Ash of War that we use quite a lot throughout the game. Um, again, you can just stick it on a dagger, and it is just it just gives you like 10 or 15% extra damage and extra um, defense for free. So there's kind of no reason not to do it. And um, heading out to the edge of that stone pillar to get a soporific grease which is an item that theoretically is very good against like a couple of enemies so just hold it until uh we mention that an enemy is weak to sleep because soporific grease is a buff that you put on your weapon um that will put them that will inflict the sleep status but that's not particularly good against a lot of things but it's very 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 fucking good against some things so heading way out to the end here, and this kind of big open bit was the Lance Talisman. And from there, we are following the cliff edge around, grabbing the Golden Rune 3. And then it, we are at the... Um... Death Touched Catacombs. That's it, yes. Now in here is where we'll get our first Death Route. And um, again, you should keep... So 
We should have Aslam on our weapon currently, but you can put Sacred Blade on your weapon currently. Um, now this bit is just sped up as we are um, using some soul packets in our inventory because that process is extremely long. But um, we're just going to use our soul packets until we can just about level up. Um, and then that way, if we die and lose our souls, it's fine. doesn't really matter because we've already basically used them all up. Just well, to interject, actually, where... we, we wanted Sacred Blade in this dungeon specifically because it has skeletons in it. And if you have Sacred Blade on, they don't reanimate. Yes, uh, this is why Sacred Blade is so, so good. Um, I mean, it's not like it's impossible, but just try and do this this particular area without Sacred Blade and it is kind of a, a night and day experience because you have to kill the skeletons twice, essentially. Um, in fact, that's not even strictly true. If you kill the skeletons and um, they have a little... Uh, reassembling animation if you hit them during that animation then they'll stop that'll be them forever but they can just reassemble infinitely so if you get kind of ganged up by them and you can't get to a skeleton that is reassembling they're just going to keep coming at you now these skeletons can actually drop a number of different things uh let's see let's see While you're ah, looking okay. for that, um, we picked up the second Ucha Katana. Um, you would only get one if you did not pick the Samurai starting class, but here is where you would get the Ucha Katana. Since we went Samurai, we now have two of them, and for a decent chunk of the game, we will be power stancing those. Yes, that is very much, that is correct. Um, and this just allows us to just up our damage output a little bit by um, spamming the the dual katana move set which is pretty solid but combined with the fact that they both do bleed we are able to pump out a fairly respectable amount of bleed uh, build up now these skeletons uh so there's some skeletons can drop the sun realm shield if they're holding it uh the skeletal mages can drop the grave scythe the skeletal bandits can drop the bandits curved sword the um the Skeletal Swordsman, which is the, the ones in here, can drop the Scimitar, the uh, Scripture Wooden Shield, Smouldering Butterflies. Uh, also, the Heavy Skeleton Swordsman can drop the Gross Messer, which is a fantastic curved sword. Um, probably one of the better ones in the game. It's very, very long as well, uh, and long weapons are good. The Skeletal Archers can drop the Longbow, but I guess that's irrelevant because we've got one. So... Here is the Black Knife Assassin, uh, which it only has like two thirds to around about half health because something something emergent storytelling. And uh, as you can see, the imps pretty much kill it for you. This thing is like wounded and it doesn't really attack like the other ones do. It's not quite as aggressive and it's got way less health. The other Black Knife Assassins of the game will be slightly harder than this one, but the imps can pretty much just solo it. And there we go, that's a death route. Which we can now give to Garank for the first item, which I can't remember what the first one he gives us is. Uh, the Beast Eye and the Claw Mark Seal, I think, are the earliest rewards you get. It's genuinely incredible that you remember that off the top of your head. But anyway, we're going back to <laughs> the round table hold. And we are probably just going to upgrade um, at least one of our katanas currently. Uh, if we are on to smith... So we, we've got so many smith and stone ones, we can upgrade the one we just picked up freely. And what we're going to do is we're going to fully upgrade one weapon before upgrading the next one with our spare... Uh, with our spare um, smith and stones. But now we've got two katanas. And I'll tell you what, it feels really good. And it also means that we have access to two ashes of war at any one time. Uh, which just kind of ups the utility that we have for any, like, any one area. So that's pretty cool. We do love utility. 
Yeah, that's why we had about 10 daggers with 10 different Ashes of War on by the end of the game. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, we're feeling pretty fucking equipped right now. So heading back to the Warmaster Shack, we're going to continue along the, the kind of beaten path, I suppose you could say, which is uh, towards the east. And uh, there's a little encampment coming up. And uh, there's like a there's a fucking there's like a dog here and a few enemies. Um, now the guy there with that round flat helmet, those are the Godric foot soldiers, and they can drop the foot soldier cap, the chain draped tabard, the foot soldier gauntlets, foot soldier greaves, and then whatever weapon they're holding, which can be a dagger, short sword, short spear, soldier's crossbow. They can drop bolts, smoldering butterflies, and mushrooms. And uh, that guy with the Great Shield is a Godric Knight. Which, again, we've already went over what he drops. But just reiterating that these ones are the Knights. The ones with that flat-brimmed helmet are the Foot Soldiers. And uh, uh, In the chest here, now we've cleaned up this Knight, you're going to get the Beast Crest Heater Shield. Um, not the Golden Beast Crest Shield. Um, the far end of the camp you're going to get an exalted flesh and on the little square ruin that we were standing next to um, on top of that you'll find the great lance think you're going to go for that now? yeah no. yeah so the, the great lance is a phenomenal weapon It's um, it's got insane reach, it's slow but it hits like a truck um, it can take some of the best ashes of war in the game like Ice Spear and Spectral Lance, my child. Um, <laughs> here we're uh, we're meeting Alexander the Great Jar for the first time. You talk to him, he asks you to help him out, you smack him in the arse a bunch until he pops out. Triumphant Delight, you get your gesture, you talk to him some more, you get an Exalted Flesh, and he'll talk to you about Redmain Castle, move on, and then the next time we find him, he'll be stuck in a cave, and we've got to help him out. So that's his quest for uh, for just now. Now his quest is worth doing actually because um, the eventual end result, which is an item called the Shard of Alexander, is a very is a very 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 good item. So we highly recommend you do his quest. Plus he's like he's just a cool dude, so let's help him out. You do have the option actually to um, to kill him now if you're really not bothered about doing his quest. And you can get a weaker version of the item we were just talking about. You get the Warrior Jar Shard instead of the Shard of Alexander. Um, instead of a 15% buff to your Ashes of War, it's only a 10%, but you can have it right from the start of the game. This is true. So here is another merchant, and he's got a cookbook, and he also has a cracked pot, so we are indeed going to buy both of those things off him. And then behind the merchant, towards the south, is... Um, if you keep going, there's like a bunch of crucifixes, and then there's an, an item. I'm pretty sure this is a gold rune, like a ship one, like a gold rune two. One, Jesus Christ! Worth every rune. Yeah, worth every painful second going to get it. So now we are just heading down the beaten path again to the next grace, and now we are at Summon Water Village. There is a boss coming up that is undead again, so we're going to put Sacred Blade on, and um, honestly, using Sacred Blade against this particular boss is another night and day experience. Um, it will absolutely melt it. Now, this boss will summon a bunch of skeletons, but I'm fairly certain the bot, the skeletons that this boss summons don't drop their equipment. Um, don't hold me to that, but I don't remember ever seeing them do such a thing. However, the skeleton enemies that you see just naturally in the wild that have the spears, um, they can drop stuff. But, uh, yeah, so as you can see, Sacred Blade is just melting this fucking thing. Um, you'd be doing so much less damage. And also, Sacred Blade takes care of the skeletons that he summons as well. So it's... Uh, a lot of the bosses are pretty straightforward in this game because it's less about a specific technique dealing with them um, rather than you have a specific plan of attack that just completely annihilates them to the point where you don't even really need to worry about what it is that they're doing to you, you know? 
and this is one of them. Now, if you hit it enough, eventually it will teleport away, summon more skeletons, so then you just need to have to chase after it, uh, hit it with a sacred blade, and then just keep going. And that's pretty much the boss. His attacks are super easy to dodge. They're mega, mega telegraphed, so there's really not a lot to worry about with that guy. So I do just want to mention, actually, while we're in Summon Water Village, uh, D, Hunter of the Dead, that we met in Roundtable Hull, um, the first time we got sent there, uh, he will appear here if you've never been to Roundtable Hull. So if you come here sort of right at the start of the game, after meeting Roderico, if you rode straight here, D would be standing outside the village over somebody's corpse. You could talk to him. He would warn you about the boss here. After you kill the boss, he'll tell you that you have a knack for weeding death route, and he will put a little mark on your map to tell you where the sending gate is that we took to go to Garank, but we skipped the step of coming here first, um, and because we'd already been to the Bestial Sanctum in the Dragon Barrow, um, D goes straight to Roundtable Hold, skipping this little portion of his quest. You don't get any other rewards for it, so you've not missed anything out by doing that. You've just saved yourself a bunch of time. Yeah, it just feels like it's a little bit more useful to just immediately get access to Roundtable Hold. So that's that's that, that is the executive decision that we made. But uh, following down this flight of stairs, we're actually going to get a pretty great item, actually. It is the uh, Turtle Talisman, and then that gives us better stamina recovery, which is definitely the best like, generically best ability that we can have at this point in the game. So, we're going to switch to that. Obviously, it's dealer's choice on your end, but we recommend it. It gets our seal of approval. Now, heading up this hill, we are going to end up going into Caled, which is definitely, definitely a much later area. Um, but we are just heading up the hill. We picked up a drawstring fire grease and an ascent butterfly on the way here. But um, we're just we're just coming here so we can um, rest at this grace for later. Uh, I guess we picked up preserving bolses as well. We're gonna pop a bunch of runes, but otherwise we're not heading into Caled. We are just getting this site of grace and uh, leveling up a little bit. So that's us at twenty four vigor. Now from here, we are gonna go back down the hill and then we're gonna go to this church. Now, we will be invaded off an NPC here, but it's fine because we have a slam to deal with it. And also, we can rest at this site of grace, and it means that if we die, we'll just respawn back here, and we can just keep trying this NPC until we eventually do it. And because we just leveled up, whatever runes we lose, it doesn't really matter. So, it's we've just got a contingency plan of banging our head against the wall until this fucker dies, basically. There is actually a decent amount of risk that you will die to Anastasia the Tarnished Eater because as you can see, she hits like a truck for this stage in the game. She also has wild strikes, so if she's in the middle of the multiple swing animation, don't walk towards her because you will just get stunlocked until you die. Um, Aslam is a great solution to this problem. You could always do the classic bait, beat, retreat, repeat. So walk in, smack her, walk away, wait for her to whiff an attack, attack her again and do that until she's dead, but we have our slam, so there's no need for any of that careful planning and tactical play. We can just press L2 until we win. <laughs> exactly. Now, we also get the Sacred Scorpion Charm offer, which is actually very, very good in conjunction with Sacred Blade, because uh, it will boost the amount of Sacred Blade damage that we're actually doing. Um, we also picked up two cookbooks there in the church. But warping back to the Bestial Sanctum, we can now give Garank two of the death route that we've picked up. Um, or we, we've given him the two death route we've picked up, rather. And we got the uh, Bestial Sling, uh, Claw Mark Seal, and the, the Beast Eye. And that's him for now. So basically just come back here periodically to give him the death route. So uh, that's not a whole lot more to say about that. Um, and I don't know why we are... don't know what the fuck we're doing just now. Couldn't tell you. Just taking stock of your inventory, I guess. Yeah, it seems so. I should probably have cut this bit out, but apparently I overlooked it. Oh well. This is just a little gift from us to you, the viewer. Yeah, we're giving you a, a tiny little uh, break in pace. God, I need it as well, actually. <laughs> 
<laughs> a bit a bit behind the curtain. This is the stuff that you didn't see. <laughs> <laughs> so warping back to Church Valley, and um, I think probably at this point we are buying. Oh, arrows! I thought we were going for the crackpot. I mean, we still might buy the crackpots, do we? We do, we do. There we go. Right, there we go. So from here, yeah, nice. I think we're going to be doing the tree sentinel. Now, uh, our technique is very, very cheesy. We actually recommend that you come back here much later on. So when we do the when the when we actually do a tree sentinel boss is probably about the time you'd want to come back and fight this guy. But if you would like his uh, the, his runes just now, well, you can make a one-time investment in a bunch of arrows and um, just cheese the ever-living fuck out of him with a bow. You can actually go up a little bit higher on this structure if you use Torrent, and when you're standing on the top, you can see his spawn point, and hitting him with an arrow will make him walk off to the right, He'll do that little animation, which is actually a spell reflect, so if you're a spellcaster, good luck fighting this thing. Um, he'll walk off to the right, get stuck on a rock, uh, try and path to you, won't be able to figure it out, and then he will quite literally teleport back to his aggro leash. Um, but since he's over here and hitting the structure, he's actually knocked that little perch down, so that wouldn't have been an option for us. But here, as you can see, he can't actually reach us, so you can just stand there and mighty shot him in the face until he dies. He drops the Golden Halberd when defeated. Um, and the Golden Halberd is actually not a bad weapon at all. Um, pretty hefty strength requirement for this early in the game. But once you have the strength to be able to use it, the Golden Halberd will do work. It has the Golden Vow Ash of War built in. Um, and its charged attacks hit like a truck. So... Um, very good at breaking stance, good damage, um, scales a little bit with faith, scales primarily with strength, all around pretty good weapon. At the same time though, uh, fuck him, uh, because we're just gonna pump a bunch of arrows into his head, and that is a, a fairly easy way of killing him at this stage of the game. Probably if you're to fight him toe to toe at this stage of the game, you're not gonna have a good time, like, at all, but uh, this is one way of killing him. And indeed, many enemies in the game can die via this technique. Um, and you do indeed get more runes than you would spend on arrows back. So it is a, it is a good investment. So back to Warmaster Shack, we are going to put Sacred Blade on. We can also put the Sacred Scorpion Charm on, because uh, we just got that. It's not necessary, because you're going to see why, because of the amount of damage Sacred Blade does to this enemy. Um, but as we've got Sc uh, Sacred Scorpion Charm, you know, when in Rome, let's have a little bit of fun. So it's, again, this is another enemy that only shows up during the night. So we are going to do that. And uh, where that troll was that had to break the rock, that is where this enemy is going to be. Now, this is a death bird, and they're pretty intimidating looking. The de so there's two variants, there's a death bird, death right bird. They both look basically the same. The death birds are uh, a lot easier to fight. The death right birds have an expanded move set that makes them uh, a little bit more formidable. But uh, regardless, they're all weak to Sacred Blade. Um, so uh, fuck it. These things went from being somewhat difficult to being um, nothing. It's, it's just nothing. I mean, what, that's three or four hits with Sacred Blade? Like... <laughs> yeah, something like. Um, you can stack other buffs on top of that as well. Um, before I expound on that a little bit, this is going to drop the Blue Feathered Branch Sword. That is the equivalent of the Blue Tear Stone Ring from the Dark Souls series. Extra defense when you're at low health. Um, you can stack a multitude of other buffs on top of the Sacred Scorpion Charm, so you could have the Faith, uh, the faith not Crystal Tear, the sacred shrouding crack to you um as well as other things golden vow flame grant me strength anything of that nature anything that would boost your holy damage or your physical damage and you can make sacred blade i've seen it one shot death right birds oh hi again edit and tony here so this point in the guide 
We're doing pretty much three bosses back to back. We've got the Death Rite Bird, we've got the Bell Baron Hunter, which is about, we're about to do now, and then we've got the Tree Sentinel, which we're going to do after. Now, for the Bell Baron Hunter, it's something important to mention is that it's one of these has to encounter it at night time kind of enemies. So just like the Death Rite Birds, just like the Black Knights, you have to encounter these at night time. So the Bell Baron Hunters always show up in some kind of building in this game for some reason. And most of the time, just setting the game to night time doesn't make them show up. So specifically, if you do want them to get up, yes, obviously you have to set the time to night time, but then you can either speak to Bernal and then rest at the Grace, which is what we've done here. Once the world reset of resting at the Grace happens, Bernal should disappear, and thus when you move into the shack, the Bell Baron Hunter will show up. Or alternatively, you can set the time to night time and then warp back to the same Grace immediately, and then Bernal should be gone, and then you can then go and fight the Bell Baron Hunter. I figured that this is probably worth mentioning because I know that I struggled trying to get it to show up and we don't really mention it in our original commentary. Okay, so now I got that out of the way, hopefully you noticed that we put on the Assassin's Crimson Dagger Talisman. Now what that does is give us back HP whenever we land a critical hit. And all I'm currently doing is resetting our Ashes of War back to the base 3, being Ground Slam, Bloody Slash and Golden Vow on the Katana. So this boss is actually a great example of how good Aslam can be because you'll notice that just due to how Aslam's animation works, it actually interacts with this boss in an interesting way where a bunch of its attacks actually completely miss you just because of Aslam. So you just do exactly this technique. You go Aslam, Aslam, it'll knock him onto his knee, then you can do the counter hit. Uh, then we get to recover a little bit of health because we put the um, the black knife or the, the red knife... Um, talisman on which gives us health back on criticals and we can just uh, keep trading hits with this guy um, using Aslam. Now if you do need to heal you must roll away very very far because his range is incredibly long but otherwise you can indeed just go Aslam, Aslam, stagger, counter. Um, but yeah you need to be about this far away to be safe from this guy. The, the range is pretty insane. And again, because the um, the grace is right there, even if you die, it's no biggie. You can just keep trying again. But Asla, and again, this is another enemy that you can fight uh, much later if you so choose. It's probably better to fight this guy later, um, but this is just a way that you can do this thing just now, and it's fairly it's fairly achievable. No. Well, the good options for Ashes of War you could use against it are. Um, square off on the straight swords, lion's claw on anything big enough to take lion's claw. True, um, true. Just anything that can break it stands fast. Now, we were able to put our vigor at 25, so now we have 25 uh, vigor, 20 endurance, which is exactly where we want to be, particularly at the end of Limegrave. Um, so we're feeling, we're feeling pretty good. Uh, we're just taking that talisman that we put off uh, back on for the green turtle charm. And there we have it, part three done. So the next part we're starting on Weeping Peninsula. If you enjoyed this video, you can follow us on Twitter and Twitch, which is the best place to follow us, I'd say. And if you're feeling particularly generous, you can sling us some cash on Patreon. But the best thing you can do ultimately, is just give this video a like, or just please just comment anything, just f anything, please. Bye, we'll see you, we'll see you in the next part.